Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's Inspiring Leadership Podcast. And I'm very lucky to have VJ Teller. Uh, VJ has really inspired me. Um, he's done so much in his life already. Currently, he is the co-founder and the CEO of Workato. And it's a really fascinating business about the automation of workflow. But not only that, he's had just an amazing career already. If you take him all the way back to doing his computer science at Madras and UCLA, uh, the founder and SVP of engineering at TIBCO, the chief strategy officer at Oracle, the VP of mobile video at Skype, and the CEO of Quick before this. That's a lot of experience that's gathered. But not only that, it's, it's lovely meeting leaders who've done so much, but it's just the depth and the quality of a person and the conversations that we've already had. VJ, I've really enjoyed what we've discussed already. Welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Podcast. Well, I'm so glad to be here, Jonathan. I've really enjoyed our conversations as well. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, well, no, it's great. And one of the lovely things about you was um, the, the the humility and the humanity that you have is one of the three things I look for, humility, humanity, and humor, the three hums somebody once taught me. And we were talking about other people. You weren't making it always about you and what a great leader you are, although people speak so very highly of you and I can see on social media too. But you had a couple of leaders that you said you found they were inspiring leaders. They've had a big influence on you. Would you like to mention them by name and, and say what it is about them that has been such a good influence on your life? Yeah, uh, for sure, Jonathan. I, I've, I've had the good fortune of working with some amazing people. Uh, there are two that I've I had a, a, an opportunity to work with for quite a while. You know, one of them uh, uh, is uh, Thomas Kurian. He's currently the CEO of Google Cloud, but he was the head of products at Oracle when I was there. Um, Thomas is uh, one of the smartest persons I've ever worked with. I mean, he can write entire 10 page specs for new products in neat handwritten notes without a back, without scratching off anything. It's just an incredible. Uh, horsepower, but he was also uh, the hardest working executive I've ever worked with. Um, and I think that had a, a huge impact on me. Uh, the, uh, you know, I believe in high expectations. We are here to get together with colleagues, you know, not to waste our time, but to make impact, high expectations. But uh, I would never uh, expect people to work harder than I am uh, willing to do myself. And a, a lot of that uh, DNA came from um, from spending that time with with Thomas. Uh, you know the the power of of uh, of leadership, uh, leading from the front. Um, so Thomas was one. Fantastic, thank you. And who was the second? So the second was uh, the uh, the CEO that I worked for right out of college and for a long time. He was uh, Vivek Ranadive, who was uh, the CEO of Tipco. Um, you know about. 30 years ago, uh, I mean, now it's the age of Indian CEOs, but 30 years ago, that was not a very common thing. Um, it, you know, whether it's about raising funds or, you know, building a company or like, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of uh, uh, things that uh, we, you know, you, you weren't, uh, you know, you don't see people like yourself uh, leading meaningful companies. And it was really amazing to see how uh, Vivek conducted himself, the confidence he had, the humility he had, and the culture that he built um, that still lasts today. Um, and he, he's, he has blazed this trail multiple times. About 10 years ago, he became uh, so the only minority owner in the NBA in the US, uh, you know, one of the four NBA teams in California, Sacramento Kings. Uh, uh, he has sort of put himself out there. Uh, he is sort of... Uh, creating major impact, blazing trails that have not been blazed. Um, and I, I, I find that very inspiring. And I feel like a little bit like I have the baton now, having worked with these kind of people to um, to uh, to do the best I can and, and be that kind of inspiration for others. Yeah, well, I, I think that's lovely to have those people that you can look to that have inspired you. And with all of the leaders, wherever we are, I've never met anyone who who doesn't have their flaws and that that you know that they might overdo a certain strength which which has got them to where they're at they just need to be careful that that doesn't become their weakness because an overdone strength but can become a weakness if you look at dick fooled of lehman brothers dick was you know the gorilla he got things done he drove it very hard but at the critical moment 
when he had to negotiate with Hans Paulsen, mm -hmm. he was so aggressive, extremely aggressive, and fighting his corner for Lehman's that Hank Paulsen went, you're on your own. You know, forget it. I was going to help you, but no, forget it. And, and of course, that brought his business down. It brought the whole system down. And so we do have to watch that we don't get so big that we sort of believe and drink our own Kool-Aid and we believe how wonderful we are. So, so keeping our humility is very important. And you have it, which as you, uh, the second question was really the experiences that shaped you as the leader you are today. Those two people have done it. But I was very interested as we were getting to know each other in the chat we had a couple of weeks ago about your upbringing with your father, uh, who was a leader too, but he was working in the, in the coal mining industry in India. And, and that was a tough environment with lots of strikes and problems and things like that. Would you just share a bit about that kind of upbringing and how your father has been such an influence to you and I'm sure your mother as well, but just your upbringing. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, you know, my, my father grew up in a village, literally with no electricity and running water, and he educated himself. He bought his family up, and then he, you know, put himself in a spot to, you know, be a, in the in the in the uh, in the management ranks at you know in this coal mining company, which has uh, which is very difficult. It's a government job; it doesn't pay a lot, but uh, uh, there's a lot of strife and actually danger. So we had like, he had like bodyguards in his car and his at home and in the office, but the way he conducted himself, right? Like a lot of people I saw in that town, which are all a coal mining town, you sort of mail it in a little bit sometimes because it's a government job, you're safe. But uh, I saw the passion that my, my, my father brought to the job and the leadership that he had and how he uh, uh, conducted himself, you know, his whole his history from you know starting from the village and creating an opportunity for us to you know be somebody's uh and that's that that's that's been incredibly inspiring and um uh, and and my mom is probably the one of the most independent thinking women uh that I've ever uh, met and she just kept always kept us grounded even today you go visit uh, visited her last month and uh uh you you know it doesn't matter what you've done I think she keeps you super real yeah, you make me smile because my late mother, she's sadly long dead. But uh, I, I remember coming and telling her that I'd won the uh, the world championship of the double mountain marathon in Cyprus. And she went, yes, dear, that's very interesting. Now, what are you having for lunch? And he's like, he's like, he's like playing it right now. And she said, don't get too big for your boots. You know, we don't want you to get too swell headed and you can't get your head through the door. All, all these kind of statements just to just to be very modest. It was really important yeah. that you understand so it sounds like mom has kept you nicely grounded and i, yeah. I experienced that with yeah. you okay yeah. and and what other events throughout your life um t tell us sort of uh, on, you know getting it through from madras into ucla and and then on to there what you know can you think of two or three milestone events that happened that shaped you as a leader yeah um i i think uh if you you know, a few few things. Um, you know, I think one of them was, I think, a you know, particularly tough time uh, where um, I was uh, uh, running my previous consumer company. You know, quick uh, You know, it's a consumer space. Uh, it was during the the financial difficulties, like in the two thousand eight nine time frame. I, I was struggling to uh, keep the company afloat. You know, we you know, we we getting it funded and and we had an incredible team like we built an incredible product it was super innovative everybody loved it but uh you know we didn't have a business model and it was hard to get funded it was really like a day-to-day -day. we were like figuring this out at the same time one of my best friends um was losing his battle with uh with uh with uh, with uh you know multiple myeloma which is like a blood cancer and um there was this period in you know in the spring of 2009 where um uh it, it really brought a lot of perspective uh to uh to uh to uh, you know you have all these responsibilities uh and, and your personal life and your work life and uh, uh you know, just uh keep your head down and keep on swimming and keeping your you know you know keep, keep you know keeping your uh, um you know your values and and so on. It's it's hard. I think uh, you know that kind of experience when you come out of it, uh, it it really uh, 
has a big impact on you, um, on, uh, on uh, you know, on the empathy you have for people and what people may be going through. Um, yeah, no, it was a, it was a big, big, big moment for me. I'm, well, I'm first, I'm sorry about your, I presume your friend in 2009 died, did he? Yes, uh, he passed away, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm really sorry about that. And 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 at the same time, all the business struggles. Um, I do, in, in a slightly different way, relate to that in that uh, on my back wall, um, the people uh, won't see this, obviously, if they're listening to it on audio, but on U on YouTube, there's a picture of my, my two brothers. And uh, uh, one of my brothers died within 10 weeks of, of uh, uh, metastatic cancer, which spread everywhere. It must have been hidden. Um, and it was during COVID and they just thought he was just having a reaction to COVID symptoms from some of his vaccinations, but they didn't pick up the fact that uh, it has spread everywhere into his brain and down his spine and his legs and things. And and that made me through the work. I, I love um, the work of the Stoics. I'm going to hold this up for you and that's on YouTube to see, but it's the memento mori. Remember you're mortal. It's the the Roman emperors used to be told um, by their slave who travel in the chariot when they were getting a um, uh, a big parade to celebrate their success, they would always whisper, sire, memento mori, memento mori, remember you're mortal, you're not a god, even yeah. though they had their faces painted in purple. And this yeah. shows 4,000 weeks, of which I've only got less than 900 left if I was to live to 80 from when I was born. Yeah. And, and it just makes you realize that I didn't see David about to die. I didn't realize that was going to happen. I'm the same age that he was when he died. And and so I count a blessing of every day. And I, I expect that was, was that something similar for you, G VJ? That 100%. Most, and this, you... this friend was like incredibly special. He was inspiring. He was, he was blind. And the company that I was doing at the time, Quick, was like a live video streaming. It was, you know, I, I didn't start the company, but I went to run the company because I was inspired with the potential for what uh, that kind of technology can do for blind people. Uh, he, he, he was uh, just a, uh, you know, incredible, uh, incredibly creative and, uh, you know, dynamic person that uh, had such a big impact on my life. And to have it within a few months to have, have him experience and go through this was, uh, was, was very hard. Yeah, no, I think. Uh, well, don't, don't lose that um, special touch that you have, Vijay. I've noticed it in our conversations. You know, uh, I think somebody wiser than me said, people forget what you say. They forget what you do. They never forget how you make them feel. Yeah. And and I think, you know, there you are in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley. It's a very famous area. There's a lot of people swilling around going to some of these tech jobs. Now, there's some very inspiring tech CEOs, but there are also some who treat people pretty poorly. And um, they just think that that street smarts are, you know, high IQ is all that matters. It, it isn't. You know, people have to want to willingly follow you. You've got to have followership as much as leadership. I don't know whether that, that resonates in any way, Vijay. Any thoughts? Oh, I, I 100 percent resonates. So even though, like, I'm in Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, and we're building the company, our headquarters are based out of there. I tell our team quite a, quite often, even though we're based in Silicon Valley, um, uh, I don't think of ourselves as being a Silicon Valley company. Partly because I think um, the template for uh, culture and uh, you know the role that we play in the society out there. I I think technology industry can do better. Uh, there is a lot of hubris around, like we are smarter than other people, like we're going to save the world and all of this um, things. Which um, I I I think um, uh, uh, I I I I think being in that part of the world, I feel like it's even more important to. Um, I want Workado and what we're doing here to set a better example and a better template for the future of how we can be a like a part of the community that we are in and part, you know better, be a better part of the world that we're in. Yeah, it, 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 and that is that is why people willingly come and work for you and your organization. And I think I mentioned to you before remitly with Matt Oppenheimer, who's a very inspiring CEO. They have such a clear mission. And they care so much about living the mission rather than just having fine words that someone puts up on the on the on the wall. That that's why people give the discretionary energy for the customers, and in their case, they they are helping immigrants' families send money back to the ones they love in India and uh, Nepal and the Philippines and different places around the world. And and I think um, getting people behind 
a mission and a cause mm -hmm. is very important. Yeah. Um, I'm also interested in, I mean, you talked about that, that tough time then. Were there any other dark moments in your life, in your business or anything for you personally, which have really shaped and made an impact on you um, and taught you something? I think, it, it, you know, I, I'd say, you know, um, every company that I've been part of, uh, we went through some uh, very difficult times. In, in in some cases, pretty existential, right? Uh, at Tibco, we went through this period um, uh, at, you know, I talked about this company, Quick, the consumer company at Workado, the last couple of years, in, in its, at moments, it, it felt pretty, you know, it's... It, I, I don't see how a company, you know, you can grow and reach your potential without without stress and challenge and resistance. <laughs> I don't know how somebody can be world class, uh, you know, without actually uh, going through uh, hard periods. Um, so I, I embrace um, uh, hard periods uh, in the economy because that's, that's exactly when you grow um, as a team, as as you grow as a company, and you're laying the foundation for um, for you know for future growth. Like when you're having experiencing the growth, it's not when you actually grew. Like as a company, it's it the foundation is 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 getting set up, and your strength and metal is being is being tested and created only in hard times. Yeah. So. Um, I love it when we go through periods where there's a lot of challenge. I mean, it's, by the way, it's still first world problems at the end of the day, um, but being challenged is how we become better. I don't, I don't know of how anybody can become great without, without going through hard times. You are so right. And I was reading some research on this. I can't remember exactly where it was in one of the many books I listened to, because I think I told you I, I'm dyslexic. So I, I can read, of course, and I can write, but I, I find it much easier on audio or video, which is why I love doing this. And I think this is about our 325th episode. So it's um, it's it's a real pleasure meeting leaders like you. Um, but they were saying, just like you were saying, that actually the depression and some of the, the toughest times were the spawning ground of some of the most successful companies over the years. Yes. And uh, you and I were sharing that with our own children and you know, I've got I've got four children two of my own and two stepchildren with Lee and they're now just all starting to enter their 30s and they're all married about to you know they've got grandchildren on the way and some some have already got grandchildren um that actually I want to help them succeed but I don't want to monocoddle them because mm -hmm. I know that in the hard times they will learn a lot from that but you don't want to have them to have abusive horrible awful times if you can help that but but you do know that, as someone once said to me, every time you have a difficult time, two things. One, what have you learned? And yeah. two, what action are you now going to take? Yeah. So you've got to do something with it. This yeah. is a lesson for you. It's a teachable okay. moment. And the University of Michigan are very good about this. About This is teachable points of view from moments that matter or crucible moments. People call them yeah, different I think they're saying Never get, uh, let a good crisis go to waste, right? Yes. That's, that's, a, that's a very one. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Well, talking of of that and the advice and tips, let's take you back to when you, VJ, were 16 to 18 years old. Probably, uh, if I'm thinking right, starting to play with computers and be interested in that whole side of thing. But if you went back uh, in your DeLorean and met yourself and you got out of the car and you said, hi, VJ, I'm, I'm yourself from the future. And I've come back to give you two bits of advice. One is, don't worry about this. And two is, this is really important. What would the the advice you'd give the younger you now? Yeah, I'd say, I know I grew up in a in a small town, um, uh, and I uh, one of the things I you know went around around that period is when I went away to for college to um, this you know IIT Madras as you mentioned, um, and a lot of the a lot of the you know folks coming there are from big cities. Um, you you feel a bit overwhelmed and and out of place. Uh, uh, you know, it, you, you kind of suffer from a lack of, you know, some confidence issues around uh, people that uh, seem to be more have have it all together. Uh, I I'd say one of the things, one of the advices I would give is sort of be true to yourself and and uh, um, and and you know, uh, you know, you know, be 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 true to yourself and have some confidence in in yourself. You know, uh, the, the other thing I would say is. Um, 
you have by 16 to 18, you have a sense broadly, not about specific career, but broadly where you want to go, what your values are, what you want to achieve. Um, I, I think there's a saying that you're the sum of the five people closest to you. I think there's a lot of truth to that. So be very intentional about, um, you, you know, uh, sort of spending time with people that are, um, that uh, are, uh, that have, uh, you know, similar missions that, that, you know, that maybe, you know, that, that you can learn from, right? So I, uh, if you're a bit more intentional about, you know, how, um, about, uh, you know, how you spend your time and who you spend your time with, you're going to probably, probably benefit a lot from that. That is a very profound bit of advice for people to listen to. And I, I really resonate that. Okay. You, you know, the, the, the wisdom over the years, you know, you are the sum of the five people you spend your time with, choose yourself, you know, choose your people wisely. And certainly as a CEO like yourself, EJ, that if you can surround yourself with an army of giants, men and women who are metaphorically taller than you in their specialist areas, you'll never work a day in your life. And it, it, it's this idea of sometimes some men and women think they have to be the biggest dog, the smartest man in the room. Well, firstly, they're probably in the wrong room. And secondly, they need to make the room smarter and they need to have other people who they can elevate and empower. So they don't have to work so hard because actually you're paid to make three decisions a year. You just got to work out what those three are and see them through. We don't, we don't need you involved in every decision. If we, if that's happening, it's wrong. And I do think that the the best CEOs, the best leaders I've worked with carefully, they, they went through a, 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 an iterative process. They didn't always get it right. That the first few people they chose, some of them weren't right, or they might have been friends of theirs that they start the business with. And then they have to thin them out, which is difficult to get the right people in. But then when they've got the right the the right mix, it's really special. And choosing to let go of someone who doesn't add love, life, and happiness to your life as a friend or uh, certainly as a, as a colleague is a hard thing to do. But actually, it, it can eat away at you if they're the wrong people. Do, what, what what thoughts do you have about that? Yeah, I think there's two things. One is what you said. Uh, I, I I you know you hundred percent believe in surrounding yourself with giants, uh, so you don't have to work much. But I I have not been a very good practitioner of that yet. Um, I I I I believe in that, um, but, but personally, I think I have some work to do to. Um, to make that happen, but part of that is uh, is uh, is reformulating your team uh, as 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 uh, as you go through different stages of the company, and that's always been very hard. Um, and uh, uh, but that's the commitment that I have, you know, for our for our you know for our team and and our, all our stakeholders that we're always going to do the best thing for the company. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think it's. Uh, you, you know, I, you're 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 absolutely right about uh, making that happen. I I can do better with that than than I've been. Yeah, and 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 I think if I was to use an example of uh, Matt Oppenheimer at uh, Remitly, up in Seattle, in that sort of tech um, network of different companies, um, he's got a great collection of his leadership team now. And he's recently the one I was trying to remember was uh, Anka Sinner. An anchor who came from Microsoft and Google has been a real great addition to his team as CTO. But he's also got Pankaj as well and, and a variety of other strong leaders who are any one of them he, he could hand over to them and they could, could run the business. And that's the importance. And I was taught this in the military that y y we, we used to do the laser simulation with tanks and, uh, and firing blank rounds, but you fired a laser at the same time. And if, if the enemy tank hit you in, a, in, a, in a, one of these live interactions, you were out, your comms went out. And then your number two had to take over. Yeah. Just like that, had to take over. And I think um, I, I encourage some of the CEOs to practice this, that they they get other people to take over for a while and they step out. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. hard to do that when you've been so used to controlling and running everything. And this is the founder yeah. syndrome kind of. Yes. Dilemma, <clears throat> that that can you can you trust others to get into the weeds of things that you've always run? And, it, and it's a hard thing because yeah. control is addictive. Yes. And and workaholism is addictive. Yeah. And, you know, you've worked very, very hard. The question is, how can we get you to work smarter 
uh, and and have that strategic time to step back, take a week or two off with your wife and your family and your boys, and and think about the bigger things. A bit like um, the old um, Microsoft founder does, and when he goes into his log cabin. But um, you know, there's that kind of thing. And they've all got a lot when they've taken time off or taken a sabbatical. They've 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 come back better for it. Have you ever done that? Uh, I have you know, not at Mercado. Uh, this this is uh, in the Mercado context. I. 100%. Uh, I first of all, I agree with that. Uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's what I should be doing, but I, I, I have some ways to go to, to get there. But uh, in my career, absolutely. I've done, you know, I've taken a couple of years off at once at one point and several months off, uh, you know, a couple of other times. And those were the times that you really get to know yourself. And um, th those were like the more more foundational building years for me than the working years have been. I think so. so. Uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I really uh, have experienced that and appreciated that. Uh, I, I have to, uh, you know, do more to make that uh, sort of dynamic uh, at Workado. Yeah, yeah, and and, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> okay, um, let's go around the inspiring leadership compass. So these are the kind of things that my wife and I, when we did our research over the last twenty years, found that what makes high performing leaders and teams. And one of them is this, this, what they, um, Bill, um, George calls, uh, at Harvard, true North, this, this moral quotient, this, this needle pointing North that you have your values, the, the way your father and your mother brought you up or whoever your primary carers were, but, but that these clear values. And I, and my question to you is what did you learn when you let your values slip? And that you had to bring yourself back onto true north. You let them slip a bit, and you brought yourself back on. What did you learn? Well, I think it. Um, uh, I I think when you lose track of why you are doing something, the big why, uh, I think you you feel like you feel like an imbalance. I mean, you can keep charging ahead for some time, but you won't have that um, the real energy. You know, uh, the drive. Uh, Without being connected to the true north, so you when you lose track of that, um, you know. I think, for example, I've mean, been very busy uh, at Mercado. Just you know, we've been a high growth company for a while, and just the business of just keeping the high growth engine and like you know creating the systems and processes to uh, to to keep up uh, has been there's been a lot of busy work. Let me put it that way. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like we have as a, you know, as a, as a, as, as a leader and as a team, um, we have really um, not spent enough time um, or lost track of, I think we did have this early on, uh, the big why, right? I think uh, we, we want to uh, do it the right way, you know, create a group of people and a company and a template uh, for being successful in business, but also uh, while being connected to a larger purpose. Uh, so that's an area that I feel like as a leader and as a company, we um, we, we have to get back to. So, um, so uh, th that's a, that's a, at the moment today, that getting, getting into 2024, this is one of the, um, that is, you know, sort of the, the deep uh, uh, drives or hunger that, we have to um, get back and be more balanced. Yeah, beautifully put. And that links us nicely to the second, which is, so from MQ, the moral quotient, to PQ, the meaning and purpose quotient, what some people call spiritual intelligence, but that's doesn't mean religious. But the two are very closely linked, but they're slightly different. And and I'm looking up here on to my left, uh, and you won't see it, but the, the values of one of the companies of a CEO and his top team that I'm working with, and and what's lovely is I can look at these values and know that in his feedback and his uh, performance appraisals of them, he's constantly looking through these values and going, how are you living these values? And people often get a bit carried away and have too many, but it it's the kind of ones that you can you can wake someone early in the morning if they're working at their company and go, what are our values? You go, oh, they're these, these. You know. But when people you go, oh, they're... let me think about it. You, you know, you haven't got it. And and I, I used to have a, a general when I was in the army for 20 years and he had his, like a credit card that slipped in your wallet. Here's an idea for you. This is free, free consulting advice. And um, it had the three values that we live by. And and he'd say, where's your card? And you'd, you'd bring your card out and you'd, you'd share it. And, and, and you'd say, okay, don't look at the card, but what are the three values? And, and we'd all know them. And 
and, and I think something as simple as that, the rule of three seems to work terribly well and those three values, but this idea of meaning and purpose, what, what gives your life for you personally, BJ, what gives your life meaning and purpose? Yeah. I, I, I think one of the things that I am um, really deeply passionate about is uh, having uh, is, is, uh, is about uh, fairness and opportunity for everyone, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coupled with high expectations right um that's uh you know we are here like you know we, we have a limited time i think we want to have the, the most impact um but you know it, it not everybody has that opportunity um uh, so to me the fairness and the sense of opportunity for you know for people within the company or like in the world out there is is really important uh, and I think there's, you know, we live in a world with a lot of change um, and uncertainty for like, you know, my children's generation and future generations. So, um, you know, helping, you know, making, you know, somehow helping uh, the, the world become a more sustainable place, I, I think is very important for all of us, uh, you know, for the, you know, for the, you know, for the sake of like, I think the future generations. You're you're so right, and and as you speak about that and uh, change and the uncertainty, I'm reminded of uh, you and I were talking beforehand about me going off shortly in June to do the 11 day Vipassana um, Insight Silent Meditation Retreat, which is based on some of the Buddha's sort of teachings for life, and one of his was of course impermanence, mm -hmm. the fact that that there is suffering in the world, and, and that's part of the world. You've got to get used to it doesn't mean you're happy with it but in your search for happiness it's coming to terms with it mm -hmm. and the fact that there is impermanence you can't set step in the same river twice the river's flowed on it's gone by yeah. and things will always be changing and i think there's um a lot of mental health issues going on at the moment and they say that some of the root of people's mental health challenges is their unwillingness to face the fact that things aren't the same that they crave something or they don't like something craving an aversion as, as the buddha talks about but they they can't actually come to terms with the fact that things are changing yeah now what are you going to do you know um well i don't like this yeah, okay you don't like it but what are you going to do about it now it, what can you control controlling the controllables and i think people feel they're more aware than ever through social media and being fed bits of information into their little bubble that they live in for their generation, race, identity, gender, whatever it might be. And they're, they're railing against something else, but actually I think taking ownership for what they can do something about is more important. And, and of course, in, in your business, you can make some changes and you can make a difference, but accepting that there is this impermanence as a, a life force is, is healthy. Do you think? Yeah. Uh hundred percent I think uh um uh yeah having that uh that that uh you know perspective of uh of 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 just being part of uh you know of a positive change um an impact uh you know but without the expectations right that that uh you know of how how the world should be right I think it's um i I think it's important to have uh, even you know embrace the changes that are happening out there it's it's you know if we if they if if things were the same they were for our grandparents and their grandparents i think it would be pretty sucky right now <laughs> i think uh, you know it's there's a human tendency to kind of look at you know big changes as as being problematic um and i think we just need to check ourselves on that and of course ai is going to be a big part and is a big part already yeah. of your world um, in, in just in a, a short bit of time, because of course it's a huge topic. Um, I hadn't thought of asking about this, but I'm just so fascinated about it. I'm, I'm reading the coming wave by Suleiman and uh, all about AI and both his benefits and, and the downside. And, and he was part of the uh, deep mind team that, uh, founders that got uh, bought by Google. What do you see as the, the great benefits of AI and what's your call out to just to be aware of in, in your own view? Yeah. So I, I, I think, um, uh, I think AI has this opportunity to really level us up, right? Um, I think, you know, you could look at AI as something that, uh, you know, takes away from, uh, from, uh, from what, you know, what people do today and like AI 
will 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 will, will do it. But I, I really think it's about um, um, uh, it, it's going to elevate um, uh, what we can all achieve, uh, and um, it you know uh, it, it, at, at a very basic level, it 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 is like an assistant that helps you. Um, it can be like an assistant that helps you. Um, it helps you do higher level things and better things and you know uh, but at, at the at the um, uh, it, it's also obviously there's so much possibility for misuse as well with with it so um as a society getting um you know uh, getting uh getting you know uh, sort of organized around how we're going to handle um you know some of the uh, the the deep fake things that are going to be everywhere. Uh, it's I think there's a lot of growth. I think it's going to force humanity to grow in ways that we've never had to grow and deal with before. Uh, you know, so that's going to be a challenge. Um, but at the same time, there's an incredible opportunity. I mean, you know, it, you know, AI tutors are going to have an ability to like, you know, like th there's there's this. There's this data out there, just to give an example, right? Uh, you know, uh, this this uh, founder of Khan Academy, the, they pointed out when kids that get tutored do one standard deviation better in school and in life. And then there's, you know, kids that have one-on-one -on -one tutoring do two, two standard deviations better. Now, AI has this opportunity to do that kind of a high quality one-to-one -one tutoring to like the most remote people in the world. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, you know, I I think it's um, it, it, it's a uh, I think it can be an incredible leveler. Um, um, uh, there's just so much uh, so much opportunity, right? So mm. uh, I'm uh, so I, I have a lot of uh, you know I I I I think it it can have a lot of positive impact, but it's going to be very disruptive. Um, some of the jobs are going to disappear, like you know when. Previous automation technologies were created. They were always there was a disruption, but the, ultimately humans, you know, like their existence became better. Like they, you know, operated at a higher level. There is that opportunity, but it is going to challenge our systems of like, you know, governance and organization, and you know, in a in ways that no other technology has in the past. Yeah, no, I think, I it, think it, whether, whether the humanity is up for the challenge, I think it's still to be seen. Correct, correct. And and if we have a higher, almost like a higher being than humans who is cleverer than us, what's going to happen then if we're number two in the pecking order? Um, will they decide that we are such a disruptive force that we actually need to be removed because it's getting in the way of, of the, the advancement of technology? Um, no, but I think that's fascinating. And, and I, as you're speaking about that, I'm thinking about my wearable tech. I've got a, one of these wearable tech, so it's a whoop strap, which I'm not, I'm not sponsored by. I used to have an aura ring as well. But that with my Apple Watch, I'm fascinated by it giving me feedback on my sleep and my recovery and warning me when I'm likely to be unwell and, and, and you know, uh, discussions with doctors, my brothers, who's a surgeon and this kind of stuff about how it can really help with our health and anticipating what's going on and for us to live a healthier life and, and identify long in advance potential illnesses or cancers that your your dear friend uh, died of that could have been detected earlier. Or my brother, you know, he probably was ill with it for about a year and a half. No one knew. No one was. Nothing was detecting it. Mm -hmm. But in the future with AI, there'll be some wearable. Well, it won't be wearable. It'll be probably in the skin. Some a little little bots going around the blood, checking on things and repairing stuff. And I was born with a hole in the heart. It'll probably go in there and repair mm -hmm. the hole in the heart and then come back out again. You know, all this kind of stuff that will change our lives in such a major way. Talking of health, what what are your tips, VJ? Because you know you're working such long hours. You got a you got a you know twin boys who are twenty. You, you're a busy man. What are your tips uh, for for other busy CEOs that that work for you about you know uh, mental health, physical health, and and wellness? What what do you do? And and it might be you say I'd like to do this, but I'm not doing it yet. But but what what would be your sort of routines? Yeah. So, you know, what has worked for me well um, until recently when I sort of broke my ankle with a cycling accident was just going away for a good part of a day by myself into the mountains and like on my bike and uh, and just zoning out, right? Like, you know, being challenged, you know, going up hills and like just 
I, I, you're not really thinking about things, but you come back with solutions to problems that you were not thinking about. You know, I think that's just, uh, um, you know, some, you know, I know, you know, like CEOs in Silicon Valley that, that do this, uh, what do you call it? This, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, some this hallucinatory kind of treatments, like they go in, in a group, they drink some, Psilocybin like, or some of that uh, stuff, or, or uh, yeah, some ayahuasca or something, and, yeah. and they, they 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 go on a trip, you know. So my trip is going out for a whole day in, in, into into much into, healthier much into healthier. the world, and um, so that that that's been like really great for my mental health and physical health. But I I think the things that um, you are talking about all this wearable technology and like how it's going to give you it's giving you so much information, but ultimately it goes back to the basics. You know, you can measure all these things and they're super helpful. Um, but uh, there's a book that I read recently called Outlive by Peter Atia. I don't know if you yeah, I love Peter Atia, and uh, yeah. Outlive is a good book. Yes, I recommend it. So to I, you. I think you know the, he goes down to what he calls medicine 3.0. Um, it's not about preventing and like you know intervening like when things are going bad, but uh, really thinking about uh, how your body works and uh, your mind works uh, and living a life that is going to uh, help you be, you know, what he calls have a healthier health span, not so much, not just lifespan, but health span. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of, I was reading that book when I was recovering from my ankle surgery because I could not go out on my bike. So that was my weekend routine. My biking routine became reading Peter Radia. Uh, but that has, that has had a big influence on me. Right. I think it's um, so there's a lot in there that I don't do, whether it's like being disciplined about the sleep or like eating and all of these other like habits that he talks about. Uh, but it's not a lecture. I think it's very pragmatic. And uh, so that's what I would say is uh, just having better awareness. Measuring things is great. I think we have got incredible way to kind of measure everything that's going on in our body. But go back to the basics and uh, and uh, and and sort of live a simpler, better life, right? So true. And um, I was thinking the other day, this this week, I had uh, one of my CEOs came and joined me as part of our coaching session in my gym here. And we had a workout together and we took it in turns to, to work out on the on the machine. And at other times I've had a personal trainer, one of one of the, we have a program called the Gladiators, which is uh, they, people come and take on these super human guys and my wife has a personal trainer who is one of these gladiators and he's built like a tree. He's like massive. Yeah. And, uh, and he trained a couple of us, which uh, we enjoyed. But I, I think having your health span match your lifespan is something I'm aspiring to. So I want to, you know, live as long as I'm going to live. My father was killed when he was 33. So that was his whole life. He didn't know it was going to be his whole life, but that was his whole life. My brother, you know, dying of cancer at 63. That was his whole life. And and I think making the most of the life that we have so that there's not this long tail off of bad health um, and you're sort of, you have the go-go phase, the slow-go phase and the no-go phase. I want my go-go phase to be almost until the last minute and I die going, wow, what a life. And, <laughs> and that's it. Um, let's move from health to emotional intelligence. Uh, as you know, one of those defining things, particularly in the tech industry, of IQ plus EQ is a great combo. Um, how do you listen well to others, VJ? Because you're a good listener. I've been I've been with you and we've been talking. You're a good listener. Whether you are with your own people, they might give you a hard time. Saying, you never listen to me. You're always telling me, listen. But but when you do listen well, how do you do it? And what's your tip to other people? Well, I think that's a really good question. I, I think that's, you know, actually it's something that I've, I know I can do better, um, especially in in the work context. Um, I, uh, I I'm talking more than I should listen. Uh, so uh, so number one, I think I, I think I, I think this is something that I I am uh, I I'm working on. I feel like I could be doing better. But when I do, I think it's um, I I tend to do this, especially you know when I'm talking to people that have like coming from completely different perspectives. Uh, I find it really um, just incredibly uh, fascinating and I I learn completely different things. So one of the things I do um, is, um, you know, there's about five to eight people in the, in you know, in the company, you know, like really down the ranks, not the people that work for me or even their reports, but 
uh, I love to uh, just meet with people in the on the front lines in the company. Uh, you learn something completely um, different, and I I find myself um, uh, so my best listening is with um, with sort of you know almost random people across the company. I make myself open, and there are people that actually take advantage, you know, like tap into my offer to uh, to, to 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 meet up with me. Other times, I just volunteer people. Um, uh, it, it's uh, I find that uh, really very energizing. Uh, I, I learn a lot more than uh, so. I I guess I what I'm with the people that work for me directly. I think I I don't listen as much as I should. But people like you know farther removed from me, I I I just love to listen. You know, and I think I'm actually pretty good at the the, the latter part. Not as good in the with the first group. <laughs> You're right, BJ. It's always work in progress. And we 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 can never be is never perfection in listening unless I've been with some pretty powerful people like that. Which takes me on to the next question, which is what I call CQ, collaborative, cognitive, or cultural intelligence about diversity, quality, inclusion. How how do you get on with people who are very different from you? Yeah, so I I find um, uh, talking to people that are very different or just going and putting myself in a position to engage with people that are very different to be very uh, energizing and stimulating. Uh, I already know like they have a very different perspective and that, you know, sometimes it's different political perspectives. Sometimes it's like a different organizational perspective. Um, I always coming, I always come out of those sessions with more learning and growth uh, and, uh, and insights into myself uh, uh, than I would with uh, people that are uh, that I tend to agree with more, right? So, yeah. um, is you know, in, in being in a tech company in Silicon Valley and as a CEO, sometimes you 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 get an echo chamber effect, and it's really important to um, uh, to fight through that and uh, and and just uh, connect with people that have very different uh, you know, sort of viewpoints or perspectives. Uh, and I get a lot of energy from that. And that's part of one of the reasons why I do this. I call it like skip level or multiple skip levels down meetings um, because the perspective from that there is always very different. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very wise. And back to the floor um, is one of the tips. I think one of the, I think one of the comments you made in an earlier conversation was, right, you know, if you're a monkey at the top of the tree, you know, everyone's like, you know, every it looks just smiling faces, but at the bottom of the tree, the view is different. I think it's really <laughs> helpful to 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 really um, get the get the get the three hundred and sixty view. You know, yeah. to or yeah. you're going to be just uh, you know it's, you're, it's, you're going to have like major blind spots. Very true, VJ. Three hundred and sixty is one of the most powerful exercises I do when I'm supporting CEOs, and they really. One of them said, I've never had 360 where I've not been defensive about it, but this time it was done in such a way I could listen to it and I could hear it. And I know I need to do that. So I think it's 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 always important, whoever we are, we've always got learning. I, I've, I'm always learning. The next one is really resilience, RQ. Um, quick tip. We haven't got that much long. Just these just quick fire questions. I'll do resilience, brand and legacy, the last three. Um, how have you picked yourself up in times of adversity? What's your tip for picking yourself up when things have gone badly wrong? I I think it's staying staying the course. I think uh, you know, as the movie, you know, like I think Finding Nemo, right? Keep mm -hmm. swimming. Uh, you know, you know, <laughs> keep, you know, have have your north star, like where you want to go. Um, trust the process and keep swimming. Uh, yeah. I I uh, yeah, there is really no other way. And uh, and I think usually. I think that you, you will you will have light at the end of the tunnel and you'll come out of it always. Yeah, uh, it's so good. I, I, I'm smiling because there's a lovely guy, John John White, who was a Royal Marine uh, and a very inspirational guy. He's, a, I think, a world kayaking champion now. Um, and Jonathan has one arm. He lost both his legs and one leg. Uh, one, he lost both his legs and one arm in an, an IED explosion when he was um, serving the British Army. And and you go well after that. How do you cope it? But there he is in a in a kayak, you know, as, as a world champion, and and he did this 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 long 
canoe competition down these series of rivers and they were behind time and they were told to pull over him and another able-bodied person who was kayaking with him in the in a double canoe and they said no no pull over he said no no i'm going to follow the three rules I said, and i said well, what are those three rules he said rule one keep paddling rule two shit happens rule three if rule two applies go back to rule one <laughs> yeah paddling. and uh so keep swimming or keep paddling um brand um we talked through about 360. What have you learned from 360 exercises on yourself? If there was sort of one area that um, the guys in your in your team and your organization listening go, I've learned this from my 360 and I'm still working on it. What, what's the, the area? Well, you know, I'm actually really sad to say that, like, you know, a process, you know, I I have not done a formal 360, right? I, you know, I, I seek out input from various people in the in the company. And I think we do need to do a, like a prop, because so uh, number one, like um, it, it's a it's a, it's a it's a big gap, and not just for me, but in our company as a whole. Uh, you know, we we know this, and we 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 want to put put that in place. But I I do I I I really you know believe in the importance of it. Um, so I I I try to get at it in in different ways. I I basically spend time as much time with individuals across the organization as possible. Uh, so what uh, well, your question was, what have I learned from those conversations? Over the, over the years, if you've ever had 360, what have you learned? Well, one I mean, thing. like I said, I haven't, I haven't had a good fortune of having formal 360s at, you know, even in the earlier companies, which is like not, you know, uh, maybe, maybe that's super unusual, but um, so I, so what, I, what I've learned from just, like talking to like people across the company is um, is the importance of communication, especially in these days, like a lot of the large team meetings are on Zoom and you just don't have a sense of feedback. You're, you know, um, uh, I, I think uh, communicating and over communicating and just being, being in, we, we can never do that enough. So when I meet with folks, um, I, I, I get a lot of really great feedback one-on-one on, -one on um, on 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 the effort that uh, we're putting into like you know having everybody be on the same page, so I think one of the things is uh, just you know keep doing that, you know keep you know you know keep investing in you know communication lines at a at a broad brush at a company as well as one on one. Yeah, very good, very good. Now it's imagine it's your last week alive. You've seen this with a dear friend of yours. Um, as you're sitting there about to croak your last breath, what would you like your legacy to be, both for your personal family wise and, and at work? What would you like people to say about you in a sentence or two? Well, uh, I would like, you know, people to think that I, uh, uh, I had clear values uh, that I, cared about the people and um and and uh and 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 really making a positive impact um and uh, that uh um that i fought hard i i i i i, uh, I uh, you know played hard and worked hard that's what i would um that's yeah. what i hope would be my legacy thank you no that's a very, very powerful legacy um just the last two questions then we'll do the, the top tip um, executive teams, you've um, been in a number of different organizations. What's your tip about what to do when you've got a team that's a bit toxic or there's somebody in the team who's toxic? How have you handled that one, VJ? What have you done? So first of all, you know, I, I, I have this you know, model for people, right? I, I just don't, I'm, I don't believe in labeling people, especially negative labels, like, you know, uh, toxic or assholes or whatever. But I, I, I do think there's toxic behaviors and assholeish behaviors, and um, and I think it's because it's important to understand the dis dis distinction because I I think you can um, you can tackle um, assholeish behaviors a lot easier than you can just deal with general assholes you know like you know so the, the so that's that's one but there are people that are going to be more prone to that and especially if they're in leadership positions. I've got very little tolerance for, um, you know, for uh, people that are toxic uh, higher up in the organization. Uh, but I always believe in 
um, in in putting a mirror to people and and trying to coach talk you know toxic behaviors out of them like uh, out of out of out of people but the the higher up in in the in the organization you go i think the less tolerance i have for that because it's 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 cancerous yeah very good and and i do love that one don't label people label the behavior you know and and i've had this with one of the leaders i had to feed it back to him i said you can't describe somebody as they're stupid that's yeah. written them off. How can they come back from being called stupid by you? But the, the the idea that they had or the behavior, maybe not even the idea, it's their idea, but the behavior was really not good. Mm -hmm. and, and it was counterproductive. It was against the values of what we had. So what are you going to do about it? How are you going to change? I think that's really good. And, and, and coaching and mentoring. And also the fact that people look at you, VJ, and they're learning you. Well, you it, know, like I'm, I, I have been an asshole. Yeah, uh, you know, at you know at various points in my life, I think it's uh, we can't be defined by our worst moments. I'd have no hope if I was. <laughs> um, great, thank you. Um, the um, the final penultimate question before the top tip is uh, a favorite book, something that you've listened to or read recently that you think that ah, was pretty good. That helped me thinking about things as a leader. Is there one that you'd call out to people? Yeah, I'd say there's a uh, there's a th there's a couple of books, right? One is a book called Anti Fragile. Yeah, uh, Sim Taleb. Uh, I really think there's a, a there's a lot of wisdom there about um, uh, about uh, the concept of like the growth mindset. Like he doesn't describe it that way, but um, it's you know there's there's the concept you know if you're a parent like you understand this concept of growth mindset in kids, but organizations uh, you know have. Uh, can have that and it's a learn it's a skill that can be learned it's not an inherent skill uh, i think that's really important because when you have that you aren't afraid to break things so you can do you can build better things um sorry the the light went off here i can still see it's okay where are we so um uh i think that uh i think there was uh that that had, had a big influence on me because of the business that we are in to is help companies become not just get better now but like get get more uh, get better permanently you know no matter what situations that you know come up they're able to they become stronger from the challenges right so that's a, that that's a that's a really great book the other one i think that has had a big impact on me is uh, the david versus goliath uh, by malcolm Ma malcolm gladwell that um uh, you know i think he has a lot of data in there that shows that like about 67% of the time like uh, or something like that. I don't know the exact percentage, but very high percentage. Uh, David wins. So there is this idea that um, in David versus Goliath, Goliath has this un an unfair advantage. It's amazing that the David won. But I, I and it, this has been my personal experience. I think um, if you know, uh, like agility, hunger, and 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 being scrappy and an under underdog, you have an incredible advantage. And I think as a you know, if you have aspirations to like uh, build a company, a business, an organization, I think it's really worth keeping that in mind. Um, yeah, that's great. Well, look, I'll let you wave at the light, and I'll just summarize what what you. If you wave to get the light, there we are. We're back in. I don't so, know. just um, for everybody listening, Anti Fragile by Nassim Taleb is very good book. I commend that too. The Growth Mindset. Carol Dweck was the author of that whole book, but it, it is still very relevant. And David versus Goliath. Okay. Um, Vijay, would you introduce yourself, uh, talk about uh, your role and your current organization and uh, give us your two minute top tip and then that will finish us off nicely. Yeah. So I'm Vijay Teller, the CEO of Workado. Um, so my top tip, we've been doing Workado for 10 years. So my top tip is like actually two tips, part A and part B. Part A is when you start out on something, um, it's really important to um, just focus on, on the... Um, you know, talk to a lot of your um, potential customers and prospects, talk to a hundred of them. Uh, try to really get a detailed understanding of the problem and um, and the people that are facing the problem and 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 have the the right kind of people around you to go tackle some some big you know big problems out there. The focus, right? Uh, and the focus is going to come from just going and meeting a lot of people out there. So I think that's uh, you know uh, because it's easy to get 
ch chase the shiny things when you're starting a new company. It's um, that's one. But I think the the the, the I think the, the that's sort of like an obvious thing, right? You know, find a find a problem and focus on it. But the thing that I think is, um, let's say you're successful in that, you kind of really um, identified a a big problem area, and you're like you 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 got a, like a unique approach, and you're bringing something to the table nobody has. You're doing something that nobody has done before. And you're creating a thought. You've created a leadership position in, in at least in the thought leadership standpoint. Um, then I think what you're going to find is that uh, 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 a lot of other people want in on the action, especially if it's an important, valuable space. You're going to have big companies, small companies, startups, VCs, all literally, you know, setting their target on you and aiming at you. So don't be put off by that. It's actually part of like. Uh, the process of 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 of, of building building a great brand. Um, I, the, there was a uh, you know we had a CFO of uh, Tipco like the, he, had, he he used to say something. Um, if you know, don't worry about competition. Like if you're not the lead dog, the view is the same. Um, so I think it is about the. Um, I think what what he meant was like we you have a clear understanding of the problem you have a point of view of where the market's going you you got it you got a team uh, you should just focus on that the fact that other people are copying you copying you is what you should expect uh, don't uh, you should be aware of the noise but don't be uh, discouraged by the noise right so I would say um, uh, just yeah you know uh, th those those would be my my point my tips. Great, great tips on starting out and how to handle success. Well, Vijay Teller, thank you very much indeed for being on the Inspiring Leadership Podcast. You have lived up to the, the brand reputation of what it's all about. L I've loved the chat with you and I wish you and your colleagues every success. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. It, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thanks.